Hello, everybody, and good morning. Um, and let me just start by thanking the organizers of this conference for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, it is a pleasure and a privilege to speak alongside so many esteemed colleagues and friends. My name is Will McGarry, and I'm a lecturer here at Queen's University. Um, by background, I'm a prehistorian and landscape archaeologist with a particular interest in geospatial technologies and remote sensing. Um, I also work in the area of heritage management and the intersections between climate change and cultural heritage in particular. In today's presentation, I'm actually going to be focusing on my first love, landscapes and prehistory, presenting results on behalf of both myself and Professor Gabriel Cooney from UCD, based on research undertaken over the last decade on the Shetland Islands in northern Scotland. This presentation um, reflects <clears throat> research undertaken during various projects, and I would like to acknowledge uh, in particular um, funding from the National Geographic Society, our mutual universities, and most recently the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. So allow me to start by situating Shetland within the wider Neolithic. Settled definitively in the early part of the fourth millennium BC, Shetland was the northernmost part of Europe where farming was practiced in the Neolithic. While often discussed in terms of its isolation and peripherality, the sea was not always a barrier to movement, some suggest. Certainly people arrived later than elsewhere in the UK and Ireland. However, it's likely that initial settlers were part of the same wave of people who settled at the west coast of Scotland um, around this time. This was a time when the sea enabled and enhanced communication and travel, allowing for the spread of people and ideas. And the earliest communities in Shetland reflected these traditions, including agriculture, monumental architecture, and the use of certain technologies, including stone tools. This connectivity is further attested to by the presence of a single porcelainite axe on Shetland. Um, and the provenance of this artifact will, of course, be very familiar to many of you here as from the North Coast of Ireland. Evidence suggests that the earliest arrivals landed in the south near the sites of West Foe and Yarlshof, but then very quickly established themselves across the archipelago, resulting in well-established communities by the mid-fourth millennium. Uh, within a generation, it also appears that these communities began to exploit island resources, including Rybakite Felsite, a blue-green rock quarried in the North Mavine region of North Mainland. This was primarily used to make polished stone tools, which are found across the island, and the extents um, of this exploitation is truly impressive, as was the number of tools produced, which were the subject of the North Row Felsite project. This project has catalogued over 600 uh, individual stone tools, and um, all bar one of which have been found on the Shetland Islands, but more on that later. Roughly half of these tools were polished stone axes, similar in style and size to those found elsewhere in the Shetland, in the European Neolithic. The other half were the enigmatic Shetland stone knives, which are unlike anything else found in the wider Neolithic world. These are usually millimetres in thickness and vary in size from playing cards size to over 25 centimetres. They're often made from felsite with distinctive natural decorations, included banded designs, felspars, round sphere lights of various sizes and plain grain felsite, showing a preference for certain rock types and sources. Some of these, including grain, um, some of these, including the more decorative examples, are worked while others show no sign of use whatsoever. They are found individually, but also in cases, the most famous of which, the Starber Hoard, um, was found by Dr. Noel Fujit um, in West Mainland. Surveying and excavating the quarry landscapes to clarify chronologies and better understand the Chain Apatoire um, was one of the central objectives of the North Row Felsite project. Field work, including a landscape survey to identify quarry sites and more targeted intensive survey and excavation at two sites, the elevated quarry at Grut Wells and the slopes of Ronis Hill, which is the highest point on Shetland, and the expansive site at the Bjorgs of Oya, as shown on this slide. In all cases, fell site is quarried from the side of north-south oriented linear fell site dikes, which ranged from width from between one to three metres. And the material from these dikes is moved to one side and further worked into rough out form for transportation away from the quarries. There is no evidence for polishing at the workshop, but cases of rock outs of rough outs have been found on natural routeways leading away from the quarries. 
The various stage, uh, stages of production remain visible at the quarry sites in both the debitage and the failed rough outs, which are numerous. The number and nature of these and their fracturing suggest that rough outs actually underwent a process of testing and selection prior to them being transported away from the quarries, where broken rough outs were left behind, and those which had passed this test were actually transported off the quarries. It was initially hoped that individual tools could be linked back to individual fell site dikes within workshops, either macroscopically or by using XRF. Unfortunately, it quickly became clear that the variation visible in the tools and in the knives in particular and could be found within a single dike, as shown on the slide here, where the fell site actually transitions from fine grained in the center of the dike and through banded and out to the chilled margin with the granite country rock. XRF results show a similar lack of specific geochemical signature, however, um, can identify a small number of likely areas or regions across the North Row complex. Once the Rothites left the quarries, they were transported across the archipelago. And the North Row Fell site project catalogued artifacts from collections in Shetland, Scotland and the wider UK, uh, creating a database and noting provinces wherever they were available. And while the North Row region unsurprisingly shows the densest concentration of artefacts due in no small part to our own efforts in the project, it is clear that these tools were being transported to all parts of Shetland. Due to changes in the coastline, it's hard to know exactly how this network operated, but it's likely that transportation networks favoured sheltered areas to the south and east of the quarries, away from the rugged and exposed western coast. Based on fell site distribution, it's also suggested that wherever possible, maritime transport may have been favoured over terrestrial routes. One specific example here is the site of modesty in northwest mainland in the historical parish of Aisting, as shown on the slide. The route is strongly suggested by the concentration not just of individual tools, but also of caches and assemblages of tools. While West Mainland has long been understood as the Neolithic heart of Shetland, due largely to the better known sites at like Scord of Brewster or the Stany Dale Temple, um, much of this attention has focused on the southern part of the region rather than the less acceptable north facing area. And also, recent reassessments of dates from these sites have now challenged this chronological set, set suggesting later Neolithic or even Bronze Age for many of the structures and field boundaries. Geospatial modelling suggests a similar combination of terrestrial and maritime networks, where a fell site was transported to sheltered coastal areas before being moved by boat across short stretches of waters or actually hopping around the coast uh, from sheltered cove to sheltered cove. This approach is substantially faster than going overland the entire way. Through this process, we see once again that the sea facilitates transport and communication and is not a barrier to movement within the archipelago. But returning to the site of modesty, the site was originally excavated in the 19th century um, and early 20th century, and re our records unfortunately reflect this history somewhat. A burnt house containing fell site knives and axes, um, some pottery and organic material were all recorded and thankfully stored in the National Museum of Scotland, where a faggot of wood was dated by Alison Sheridan in 2012. A subsequent follow-up date on pot residue by our project and processed by the Chrono Centre in QUB returned a very similar date. Excavations from the quarry site at North Maybean provided similar, some organic material resulting in three dates from the bottom of a quarry pit, and each fit within the similar chronological window between the middle and late of the fourth millennium BC, a date shared by the artifacts found at Modesty. While we cannot be 100% sure, it is however likely that both the quarries and the site were contemporaneous, and likely, albeit somewhat less certain, that the fell site from Modesty actually came from these quarry sites in North Row. So the dates from the quarries and the contemporaneous date from the case of stone tools uh, found from modesty suggest that this site may give us a truer picture of the early to middle Neolithic um, settlement in Shetland and suggests a new focus of attention going forward. It also suggests that fell site and its distribution can be a very useful proxy for Neolithic activity worthy of further exploration. 
initial explorations of the area around modesty have certainly been very positive and actually include a cornucopia of previously unknown sites, including an enormous toppled standing stone, field walls and three heel shaped cairns, all within one kilometre of the original site. These features also speak to the chronological longevity of the site, which likely stretches well into the Bronze Age. And of particular note here um, was a felsite hammerstone found in the socket of the standing stone, toppled standing stone visible in the top left of this slide. Interestingly, from this location, the summit of Ronis Hill is visible on the northern horizon. So there is a line of sight between the standing stone and the quarry workshop area. So, so far we have explored how the sea acts as a connector rather than an isolating factor in both the initial settlement and in the subsequent economy of Neolithic Shetland. This dynamic is, however, juxtaposed by other peculiar insular aspects of Shetland material culture at this time, like the stone knives, which show a tendency towards local adaptation and typologies. And other aspects of Neolithic life on Shetland similarly suggest a degree of separation after an initial period of contact. Alison Sheridan has noted the complete absence of regional pottery typologies on Shetland until the late Neolithic and early Bronze Age. And throughout the Neolithic and into the Bronze Age, distinctive chambered cairns evolved to include an island-specific triad of features, including a passage, a trephile chamber, and a distinctive heel-shaped facade, as shown at the Puns water example on this slide. Of perhaps most significance to this discussion is the near complete absence of felsite artifacts out with Shetland. The North Row Felsite Project database is only two tools which can be securely provenanced um, outside the archipelago. As such, 99.66% of polished stone felsite tools never left the island. This suggests a degree of selective insularity not entirely explained by location. Those familiar with other island societies and archaeologies may be familiar with this dynamic, which John Robb refers to when speaking about Malta, as a process of prehistoric self-identification, where choice and intentionality are more important than geographical limitations. But all good things, I suppose, must come to an end. And by the end of the Neolithic, Shetland appears to be plugged back, in, plugged back into the wider Neolithic regional styles, including a small amount of beaker pottery and the adoption or importation of maces, battle axes, and other late Neolithic stone tool typologies. These are made from a wider range of tools, um, including the examples shown on the screen here, which are made from serpentinite. So this presentation has shown what stone tool production, distribution and use can tell us about life in Neolithic Shetland. It is suggested the Falcite may act as a proxy for an otherwise elusive period of prehistory and that its distribution or in fact lack thereof on a wider scale can tell us about the role of the sea in understanding insularity and human agency. There are of course many outstanding questions and I'd like to finish with the most popular one. Fans of Jimmy Perez and the Shetland TV series will know that the islands are famous for their barren, windswept, and crucially, a treeless landscape. While deforestation is often associated with Neolithic expansion elsewhere, it has long been assumed that Shetland was in fact always treeless, due in no small part to the incredibly strong winds. So if this was the case, why are there so many axe heads? And even if they are serving other purposes, how exactly are they being hafted? We don't have the answer for this now, but excitingly, the paleo environment of Shetland is the topic of a Codrat funded PhD project currently being undertaken um, by Hazel Mosley um, here at QUB. And we were finally able to visit Shetland in July this year to undertake some peak depth surveys and collect some cores near the quarry sites. It is hoped that these will begin to fill in some of the geographical gaps in our understanding of the landscape change on Shetland during and around this period. So I'd like to leave you with this view of Ronis Hill from the coastline of the site at Modesty. Um, and with some key thanks to certain people and certain organizations, not least the many people who have worked on this project um, over the years and the financial support we have received from many um, organizations. So I'm going to leave it there, but I'd like to uh, thank you all for listening and say that, and I use a, a, a Shetland word here, which seems rather appropriate, uh, to knap, 
and to say that I look forward to connecting with you all in the discussion session um, at lunchtime today. Thank you very much.